Bueno, muchas gracias a Finosummit, Andrés, al equipo de Finosummit y bueno, al, a la audiencia presente aquí. Ya sé que la mayoría de las personas aquí entienden de blockchain, que va a ser el tema de conversación cuando los panelistas suban. Eh, pero antes de eso, déjenme hablar un poquito de por qué estoy aquí y por qué me interesa tanto este tema de blockchain y me interesa tanto el tema de la identidad digital. Bueno, como dijo Andrés, yo soy como Bruce Wayne y Batman. Eh, tengo una identidad de día. Yo manejo un fondo de inversión de oro y varias estratégicas de inversión en instrumentos físicos, tangibles, como esta mesa. Eso viene a raíz de, de muchas uh, experiencias pasadas, inflación, devaluación. Eh, pero en el 2010 sucedió algo muy interesante con un cliente, un amigo, que me abrió las puertas al tema de blockchain. Y desde entonces vi el cambio que iba a venir en el mundo de la banca. Yo empecé mi carrera temprano como un empresario. Eh, después eh, me metí en el mundo de la computación y después eh, seguí hacia uh, el mundo de venture capitalism. Y como venture capitalist, venture capitalist eh, pues me surfí la ola del internet eh, muy exitosamente. Y a raíz de ahí, eh, como todo buen venture capitalist, me hice un banquero. <risa> As a banker en una de las jurisdicciones más interesantes del mundo que es en Suiza, un Swiss private banker. Pero muchas cosas empezaron a cambiar y el tema de la identidad, eh, KYC, AML, cambiaron muchas de las cosas en Suiza y pues la banca, yo, la banca suiza yo la vi eh, pues cambiando, cambiando también ante mis ojos. Total que me fui de Suiza y me vine a Nueva York y trabajé para Morgan Stanley por un poquito más de ocho años en la parte de Private Wealth Management, donde también la mayoría de mis esfuerzos estaban centrados en el tema de identidad. Eh, recopilación de documentos y información y firmas y pasaportes y, y bueno, para los temas de identidad internacional muchísimo más difícil. Bueno, de vuelta al 2010, cuando este amigo me introduce al blockchain, me mandó el papel de Satoshi Nakamoto, me lo leí, no entendí nada. Me lo leí, me lo leí la segunda vez y me senté si yo fumara puros, me hubiera fumado un puro con un scotch y hubiera dicho, se acabó mi carrera en banca porque vi que esta tecnología te tiene, está preñada con la capacidad de un cambio de mundo en la manera en la cual se hacen muchas cosas en la banca. Mi intención hoy eh, es transmitirles a ustedes cómo el blockchain tiene la capacidad de ayudar, en parte, porque no es en su totalidad, a, al cambio que está viniendo. Eh, Fintech es un cambio que tiene como su subclasificación, en mi opinión, el blockchain. El cambio que viene en Fintech, en parte, es centralizado, pero lo que trae blockchain es la parte descentralizada. Y la parte descentralizada tiene muchas... Uh, ventajas. Eh, varias de las ventajas más interesantes que yo veo en el blockchain o distributed ledgers, que al fin de cuentas es lo que es, es una base de datos, un ledger, que mucha gente comparte. Ayer en el concurso de coaching di la analogía que el blockchain es una carretera y los smart contracts y los tokens son los carritos que corren sobre esa carretera. Eh, entonces, ¿qué pasa cuando uno utiliza esta tecnología de distributed ledgers o de blockchain en el mundo de identidad, y e fintech y e banca? Blockchain tiene tres cualidades interesantes que, me, que, que son las que más me atraen. La primera es la mutualización de la información. La segunda es la inmutabilidad de la información. Y la tercera es la sincronización de esa misma información. Cuando tú sincronizas 
mutualizas y permites que la información dentro de, esta, de estos paquetes sean inmutables, pues cambias el paradigma de cómo funcionan las bases de datos hoy en día. Puedes hacer un cambio, pero no cambiando la entrada específica, sino haciendo una adición a la entrada, lo cual cambia de una manera fundamental cómo se hacen muchas transacciones. ¿Qué tiene que ver todo esto con identidad? Bueno, en parte, en una gran parte, la identidad es una acumulación de, creden de credenciales. Mi licencia de conducir es una credencial. Mi, yo vivo en Estados Unidos. Y en Estados Unidos la credencial non plus ultra es el social security card. Esa es una credencial. Tu diploma de bachillerato, de universidad, son otras credenciales. Como banquero yo tengo licencias. Series 7, 66, 31, 3. Eh, todas estas licencias son credenciales también. Eh, todo eso son credenciales que en conjunto forman una identidad. Y esas credenciales están verificadas y emitidas por distintos, uh, distintas entidades. Entidades en ciertas uh, instancias bancarias, en otras instancias gubernamentales, en otras instancias son compañías de seguros, eh, universidades. Todas esas credenciales juntan, amalgaman eh, lo que es la identidad de esa persona. Mi opinión es que, utilizando FinTech y Blockchain, tenemos la oportunidad de poner encima de esa plataforma un Identity Management System que ayude a las personas que están poniendo su identidad o sus credenciales dentro de este sistema a tener la confianza de, primero, ponerlas ahí, y segundo, de que sean utilizadas para lo para los efectos que son necesarios. Abrir cuentas bancarias, pedir préstamos bancarios, tener un historial crediticio que en el mundo de Latinoamérica pues, falta mucho. Eh, y nos permite tener eh, predictive markets, entender cómo potencialmente sacar una historia crediticia de una persona. Y eh, nos permite hacer cosas como lo que está haciendo Tradle. Mi amigo Jim Van Grieve y yo nos sentamos en mis oficinas de Morgan Stanley hace, mucho, hace muchos meses, no años. Hablando de la importancia de KYC en AML, lo cual esto ayuda. Total que estamos aquí para invitar a, a tres panelistas, que escribí los nombres para que no se me olvidaran. Eh, Jovan Putra, Daniel Vogel y Juan Llanos, los cuales van a ayudarme a interpretar la importancia de identidad y blockchain para Latinoamérica. ¿Y por qué es importante tomar en consideración en consideración, esta tecnología para la utilización de los sistemas bancarios, para los desbancarizados, para los subbancarizados y para que la banca no sea desintermediarizada por estos empresarios que están avanzando a una velocidad bastante rápida. Con eso invito a Yalak, Daniel y Mr. Janos. El resto de la sesión va a ser en inglés, por respeto a nuestra panelista Yalak. So, from now on, we shall be talking in English. So, there you go. All right. So, thank you for joining me and us. Uh, Yalak, uh, Daniel, Juan, please, in that order, why don't you kindly introduce yourselves, say a little bit about yourselves and why you're here, and I'll continue with my questions thereafter. Hi, I'm Jalak Jebin Putra, founding partner of an early stage venture fund in New York called Future Perfect Ventures. I started investing in the blockchain a, a couple years ago, about the time I started the fund. I've been an investor since 1999 out in Silicon Valley, New York. I've invested all over the world. And when I first saw this technology, I just um, became really enthralled in, in it being really a new computing paradigm, the same as the internet or the PC was uh, prior to this. 
Hi, my name is uh, Daniel Vogel. I am the co-founder and president of a Bitcoin startup in Mexico called Bitso. We, are, uh, we trade Mexican pesos for Bitcoin, and we're aim, our aim is to sort of bring the infrastructure of blockchain and Bitcoin to the country. Um, I, I'm from Mexico, but I spent 10 years in the States. I studied at Stanford University Computer Science and Economics. And when I first found out about Bitcoin, um, one of the things that Bitcoin solved was one of the things that in my computer science class we had proven that couldn't be solved. Although, to be fair to my professors, the paradigm had shifted in a way that made it now solvable. And I became just like Ari. I read that white paper and I was just, just completely fell in love with the technology. Um, then I went to Harvard Business School and I decided that I wanted to spend at least the beginning of my career in this space and I'm super excited to be here. So thank you. Hi, my name is Juan. I'm an expat from Argentina, living in the US. And uh, I, it's, it's the odds of me being here, <laughs> impossible almost. But I grew up in Argentina in Buenos Aires, the province of Buenos Aires. And uh, I started working in, uh, I was academic, uh, had an academic path. And I decided to flee my country in 2001 <laughs> before the big crisis. So, and I landed first in Europe and then in the New York and worked for the remittances industry, money transfer industry. So I've been working for the underserved segments of society in, in financial services for them, you know, the banked, underserved. And uh, I developed this uh, specialization in anti money laundering compliance, regulatory compliance, consumer protection compliance. And also I was struck by the, <laughs> bitten by the spider in uh, probably late 11, and, uh, and I was really blown away, and I saw uh, two things, risks, because I have a mind for risks, and then opportunity and disruption, uh, the writing on the wall for the future of financial services. Okay, thank you. So we have a few questions here that I'd like to run through. Um, so I'm going to present the questions, a um, bit of, of a flavor here. So. What is the potential scale of disruption for blockchain, considering that we have LATAM probably a few years behind uh, the developed world, or say, the United States and other countries that are more advanced? Um, Jolak, please. Sure. Well, I guess there are two ways of looking at it. One is you can say it's a little bit behind, but then we're also seeing use cases um, around the world and outside of the developed world um, that are actually kind of leapfrogging what's happening in the United States. And I'm sure you can <laughs> talk to this in a bit, but um, I, I'm an investor in a company called BitPesa, which is uh, Nairobi based, um, and for those of you who know about M-Pesa, which is the mobile money system that uh, Safaricom started uh, back in 2007, uh, Kenyans are, are transacting a majority of their GDP through this mobile money platform, and when BitPesa came to me for financing, um, I thought it could be kind of the cross-border M-Pesa, where Bitcoin and the blockchain could actually enable uh, remittances, both personal and business remittances um, across borders with less friction. Uh, right now in Africa, it takes, um, or, uh, some of the fees are 20% if you want to do inter-Africa trade, and BitPesa has brought that down to a flat 3%. So that's an example of a place where we're seeing you know, innovation, um, I mean, you can't, I can't see anything like that happening in the U.S. where, you know, we, we have credit cards, we have functioning banking systems. Um, I mean, the banks are starting to experiment with it on, you know, for settlement of their trades, but in terms of um, broader usage, I actually think um, we need to look outside of, of some of the developed uh, markets. So could I sum up your statement by saying that this is a place where it is needed, not necessarily wanted, and in the developing, in the developed worlds, it's something that they want more yeah. than need. It's a nice to have, and as an investor, you always, you know, I always ask myself the question: Is it a, a, a nice to have or a must have? And and banking um, is is just, or you know, taking out loans and being able to transact. I think it's just 
you know, it's kind of part of human nature. This whole, you know, been transacting since the beginning of time. The currencies we use have, have changed over time. And, and that's where I think this becomes really exciting, especially when you think about it as, as data, too, and, and not just money, but, but using our data as currency down the road. Thank you. I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. So um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit specific to Mexico, which I believe Colombia and all of LATAM have obviously a lot of similarities. Um, so Bitcoin has this really cool property that is uh, you can send a Bitcoin to anyone anywhere in the world for almost no cost. And this is something that you just couldn't do before. And so one of the things that I find uh, so mind-boggling is that you have a world where people can send email, WhatsApps, you know, Facebook messages from anywhere in the world, extremely easy. But it's still really, really hard for someone in the United States to send $5 to someone in the southern neighboring country of Mexico. And, um, and to me, that's one of the most exciting use cases. And we see that in our platform already. So we have people who might not be the traditional sort of remittent, remitters, because they need to understand what Bitcoin is and they need to you know, have some amount uh, or degree of sophistication to understand the technology. But we have people who are actually sending, you know, value across the border for a very low cost today, which is something that was impossible with, before you had this infrastructure built and before Bitcoin. And, um, and I think this is sort of the, if you look at disruptive technologies, you know, Bitcoin is by no means the first one and it won't be the last one, but you see this trend always. You see this trend where, you have a technology that might not be the best one for everyone, but it fills a, very, a need in a very good way for some segment of the people. And then this technology sort of grows and becomes easier and better to use and starts becoming um, a lot more consumerized so that a larger segment of the population can use it. And I think that's what we're seeing. And so when you ask me, like, you know, uh, the question is the, the potential for disruption in Latin America, I think so. We've already started to see remittances cases, although maybe at a small level, but I think remittance is something that there's no reason why someone who wants to send $20 has to pay eight to $12 flat fee to do that. So I think you're gonna see that and, you, and we started to see this. I think international cross-border payments is a, is a very second easy one. We already have companies who you know, have to pay people in either another country or receive payments in Mexico and, and they've choosing to do that with Bitcoin just because it's again easier, it's, it's, it's cheaper and it's faster than trying to use the traditional system. And I think then there's like a whole other layer which we might probably speak a little bit later today, but like all these antiquated systems that were built in a security layer um, that was sort of envisioned prior to blockchain, which is you had these locked systems that could only be innovated by those who had the keys to those systems. And the security layer sort of worked in a way that the ones that had the code were very, very few ones and they had all the access. And then you have a technology that is built inside out where everyone has access to the code and the security layer is, does not depend on who can see it and allows anyone to build on top of it. And I think you're going to start seeing use cases in identity, in you know, notary services, in land property rights systems. And, uh, and this might be a little bit later uh, stage for, you know, might come a little bit later, but I think we're going to see all of those. Thank you. Would it, be, would it be helpful to provide some context about Bitcoin and blockchain, where it works? I was about works? to do that, but... Because, let me, can I... Go ahead. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm reading faces, and I see some blank faces. And I think, let's think about this. And you think, based on what I'm going to try to explain, how disruptive it could be, right? Think about uh, a digital asset, a, an attachment, an email, or a document, a PDF, a doc, an Excel sheet. You put it in your email as an attachment, you send it over to Daniel here, and how many copies of that document are there? Right, think about it. I mean, you have, you produced it on uh, Word, maybe, right? You have it in your, on your hard drive, you attach it to your email, so it goes to the email server, in some repository there, and when it arrives in destination, it goes to his email server, probably a different uh, uh, technology, and then he downloads it, probably downloads it into his uh, drive, right? So there's at least four copies moving around. So what Bitcoin did in the, at the beginning of 2009, 2009 was make a digital asset uncopyable. Think about that. So there's, there's now the ability to create an asset digital file that travels over a network, but it cannot be copied. 
So the registry of that asset, if you will, or the whatever it carries as a digital container is unique and it cannot be replicated. So, and, and this is one of the main things that make it, uh, you know, I think it is a, a graphic image of how disruptive it can be. But there's other ways that you can see other, other features that make it revolutionary, right? So, uh, and Daniel has started talking about that, right? We alluded to it. So number one, uh, think about any value system today, right? Every single, your money or the accounting of your money is held in private ledgers, private computers. So if you, if you uh, trust Bank Colombia and you get your salary or your wages deposited into Bank Colombia, you trust Bank Colombia to keep track of your in and, in and outflows of your money, right? You, there's a ledger in their computer systems that record how much money you have. If you go to a, if you want to make an investment, same thing, it goes to a different company, that data, the, the value gets transferred, so there's, so, but there's replication of value, and there has to be a lot of balancing of ledgers internally, right? Because how do you know that money went out of A and landed in B, right? So you have to be a debit here and a credit here, right? So in, in Bitcoin, that, there's a single database, a single shared distributed database that everyone, even individuals, if you have the ability to download the database, are able to see. Fully transparent. You can see an account, or the equivalent of an account, and the balance of that account, and you can see the value. You can see five Bitcoin, 100 Bitcoin, 64 Bitcoin. So think about that. Is, is that disruptive, right? <laughs> so you have uh, a, a shared ledger now that is distributed across the world. Even individuals can read it. But the value, the accounting, or the actual monetary value, uh, is actually visible and transparent to the world, right? So, and of course, you talked about immutability, and it was a very nice description of those features. And what happens with privacy, with confidentiality? What happens with anonymity also? Because the second feature you have to remember, to understand, is that for the first time in the history of electronic payments, and let me be hyperbolic about it to create suspense, the first time in the history of monetary or uh, financial technology, value travels without identity. So you transfer value without the identity of the owner. Think about that. So there's challenges here for identity verification and who owns the asset. Is, it, is my identity somewhere that certify that I, I own this, these Bitcoins? Or is it, what is it that makes me an owner? So all these things are being challenged because value travels without identity. So transparency of the ledger, uh, segregation of value from identity, and the lack of a central authority to certify ownership and transfer are the three biggest uh, features that make it really revol revolutionary. So it's, it's, it's really amazing, and I know what was going on in your mind. Bankers might be very worried about money laundering and, and compliance and all that and uh, what happens to my confidentiality. Will people know how much money I make? Will people know how much money I have in, in, in some account? And they're all legitimate concerns. And this is what, how, how, what, what the things are being um, challenged now. Thank you, Juan. And also, and also being developed, right? There are a lot of startups now, or, and, and kind of smaller startups, larger startups who are working on addressing all of these questions. Just, you know, I, I view it as how the mid-90s were with, with the internet, and that's, so that's exactly where the it. blockchain is right now. Yeah, so what DLTs is to finance is what the internet was to commerce, in a way. Um, all of your answers are very helpful. We have uh, 34 minutes left, so let's keep that in mind, because I would like to create the arc of the story here. So uh, in the law of diffusion of innovation, we have 2.5% innovators, 3.5% adap early adapters, 34% early majority, 34% late majority, and 16% laggards. Where in LATAM do you see we fit? Yeah, I think, um, you know, blockchain is so broad, and there are so many potential uses for this thing that I think we're in different parts of that curve, you know, for different things that we're doing. And so, you know, you start seeing uh, places where it's easier or easy to buy or go in and out of Bitcoin. Examples are Chile, Brazil, Mexico. There are places like Colombia where it's still hard, really hard to get your hands on Bitcoin in this country, you know? And so um, 
And then, and then if you're talking about the more advanced uses of blockchain, like you know, identity verification, like property rights, I think we're even behind. No? And so, but, but, but by any means, I think we're by the, you know, the first ahead that we are, we're still by the early adopters, you know, by any measure in, in this space, or that would be my opinion. I see shaking of heads, so we are in agreement. And another thing that uh, I forgot to mention, but it's makes, it, I think will add to the complexity, <laughs> is that the token can carry, has a market value, so you can trade it, you can buy it. So it functions as money or as a currency, although it's not issued by any authority, any government. So it's electronically issued. So you can, be, you can buy and sell these tokens in some technologies that are blockchain technologies or DLTs, distributed ledger technologies. And the, sec the other thing, the mind-blowing thing, is that the actual digital token can be programmed, is programmable. So you can add code inside this container to execute some uh, logic, right? So you can, you can uh, program a condition. Pay these, these 100 Bitcoin uh, when I die uh, to my niece, for example. You can, that instruction can be coded into an individual unit and so that that is executed when the event, external event, occurs. Of course, they have to be readers from outside, and et cetera. And another thing that is really mind-blowing, and completely off your question, but <laughs> is that there are competing blockchain technologies today. There are multiple technologies that are emerging. There's private and closed and open. We're going to talk about that later, but it's... Uh, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll take it, your lead, uh, Juan. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about Bitcoin, and um, we've been talking now about uh, smart contracts, which is what Juan alluded to. Uh, so there's an important uh, distinction to make, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll complement uh, what the panelists have said. Um, Bitcoin, the currency, and Bitcoin, the blockchain, are not the same thing. Bitcoin, the blockchain, is a value transfer system that uses a technology to transfer value. Bitcoin, the currency, is the value that is being transferred within this value transfer system. It's a car on the road, as you explained it. I said yesterday in our crash course that Bitcoin would be the car and the blockchain would be the road where the cars travel. Now, interestingly, over the course of the last five, six years, we have seen the development of a number of uh, Bitcoin blockchain-based applications. And moreover, the development of non-Bitcoin blockchain-based applications, uh, blockchains like Ethereum, uh, that use a completely different manner of proving the value. And then we have other companies that use blockchains that are either private or public that are neither Ethereum or Bitcoin-based or counterparty, or any of those. So the beauty that we have before us is that the technology of blockchain, whether it be tied to Bitcoin or any of the uh, currencies that use proof of whatever, and or the blockchains that are private, which is what banks are mostly attracted to these days, permissioned ledgers, also known as, or non-permissioned ledgers, which is what blockchains are. So. That may have been too much information, but it's important to show the breath that has mushroomed out of this one little <laughs> white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. So with that said, let us continue so that we can get to the point of identity here. <laughs> I'll skip a couple of questions. So um, why is identity important to banks uh, and to the regulators today? May I ask? Sure. So that, that's my field of study. <laughs> so, so identity pursues two purposes, right? Think about it. Taxation and law enforcement. Why do governments want us to be identified? Why do, are we tracked in our behavior? So why is our identity verified at every toll booth? Because people need to be arrestable if they commit a crime, or taxable, if they use services. And funds, also, another aspect that doesn't have to do with identity, but funds need to be seizable. 
So these are the two things that we need to deal with, and we're going to talk about that later. But the reason for identity, and identity, think about identity, your human identity, at the more philosophical level. Why does a government need to certify that you were born? So you were born, right? So you're a human being, you're breathing, you just came out of your mom. <laughs> but why does a government need to certify for you to function in society that you are born, right? So you have to go through a government process, bureaucratic process to certify your birth, your identi identity, the beginning of your identity. And the standard in the world of finance today, in the world in general, is unexpired, government-issued, photo identification. These are the four features of an acceptable uh, form of ID. And Colombia has even added biometrics. So imagine. So we have an unexpired government-issued government photo ID. So that is a standard today in the world. And the unintended consequence of that, it was a, very clearly explained this morning uh, by ch the French gentleman, or Belgian gentleman, mm -hmm. was uh, selective exclusion of two-thirds of the world where which don't have, in countries where they don't have reliable identity systems. Because there's no government controls, there's bad technology, there's no basic infrastructure. So there's no identity, and there's two-thirds of the world that are excluded from accessing basic financial services or any services because of their lack of identity. So that's kind of my point of view in general uh, about identity, and we're going to talk about that later in my regulation talk. I, I'm just going to add, I mean, if we bring it back to financial services, um, in, in the U.S. we have the FICO score, the, the credit score, right, that gives banks um, a certain level of certainty whether you're, you know, likely to pay back a loan or, or a good citizen. And, um, and what we've seen in the last few years with all the kind of data that's being created um, around us, that there are other ways of assessing credit worthiness. And, um, and it doesn't have to do with those traditional kind of credit scoring mechanisms. And you know, we have two and a half billion people in the world that are completely unbanked. Actually, the US has a big problem around this and uh, with the millennials. Um, you know, they got into the job market at a very tough time post 2008. And a lot of them don't have the traditional banking history that U.S. financial institutions have looked for, which is kind of like how the rest of the world has had to, to get by. And, and I think part of the promise of, of the, the blockchain is, is that you can um, and it certify you know, different pieces. to be able to do business with them. And, and I'll add to that there, there's a huge value for consumers as well. So just for regular individuals. Like, you know, I, I, I spent 10 years in the United States and the amount of times that I saw friends of mine going through identity theft because, you know, it just, you, you, you have these two worlds. You have a world where you have a social security number and FICO scores that's supposed to be very advanced, but if someone, you know, if someone, if there's a data breach on Target and someone gets a hold of your information and then suddenly, you know, you have things added on your record that aren't true, you're screwed. And then on the other side, you have, uh, you know, a place like Mexico that has really bad, um, you know, s s s identity for, for its residents mm -hmm. and you're equally screwed because I can't, I can't get a credit card in Mexico even though I have a credit line in the United States just because there's, I just haven't been able to build what the institutions in Mexico believe should be proper of, uh, of an individual with a credit card. And, um, and so you live into the, in, in these two very imperfect worlds. And I, I think there's a huge value. It, and, and the problem is that as a consumer, 
I can't, I don't have any way of changing what my government or, or what these systems think of me. It, they, they basically have a monopoly on my identity. And that's incredibly interesting because I wish that I could come up with an alternative way to show people, you know, what are the things that I've accomplished in my life and what is my personality and what's really my identity and why can, and, and, and have a really provable way to show you that I, that I went to this institution, that I took out this loan and I didn't default to, to it, that I have a credit line with this bank and I've been you know, paying my bills every month, so that when I go to ask for something else to another institution, they don't have to rely on what my government created or didn't create it 20 years ago, but they can rely on a new system where you know, every one of its players have control over what they want to issue on, on someone's identity. And I think that's like a you know, very, very, very interesting world that I think we might be moving to, where, where we just have more control over that. Yeah, fascinating. It's, uh, may I add something? Yeah. Sure. The <laughs> I like to talk a lot, because you don't know. But uh, and I have a lot of opinions. I've been researching this for years, and I've written about it. So uh, bad choice for me to, to be here. So uh, the keep it to a minute. Think about I, I, let's, let's go to your lives today. Every time you go to an e-commerce site, you have to open a new account. So you reveal, you trust your personally identifiable information, PII, to every single merchant that pops up on the internet having no idea how safe their servers are, their databases are, if they have corrupt employees or irresponsible management, you just create an account. And then, of course, you enter your, card, uh, your credit card number, and every time you pay, our identity and part of our identity travels with each payment through the wires of the network. There's no wonder there's so much theft in the world, right? And have government-issued photo identif identifications Stop that? They haven't. They haven't. Has crime uh, stopped or been stopped because of government issued IDs? You can get a, a fake ID in Jackson Heights for 50 bucks. So. Let, me, let me stop you there for a moment because I think that I'd like to weave a little story here because we understand why identity is important and why identity is important. Uh, what identity is the concentration of these credentials, how it needs to be implemented, where. Uh, the technologies that can be used both centralized and distributed. So we have one common theme that impacts us, the identity owner, and those who, like Daniel just said, those who actually take over the ownership of that identity, whether it be the institution who holds it in a bank or whether it be those that issue it. The common theme that I've seen that everybody seems to agree on with regards to identity is security. How do you ensure that the deposit of all of these credentials and the identity is going to be safe and secure? So, it is my opinion, based on my conversations with general uh, people in the space, that I would like your opinion on, that cryptographic security at the data element level, what's called hoteling of cryptographic security, um, is going to be something that will have to be pushed into the cloud in a manner that allows for the identity owner to have access to his identity and for different layers of permissioning to be granted at the right time, at the right place, to the right authority when and if it suits. So, cryptographic security, do you believe or think that is this necessary prior to solving identity management? Is it something that doesn't necessarily have to happen in a distributed manner? I'm going to leave the question a little bit open because I'd like to intervene and make it more conversational. So, Jalak, why don't you give me your feedback? I'm going to ask Daniel what they're doing. But, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think security is key. I mean, we, we, but there, there are new technologies that have been around that can be repurposed or, or will be created to address this. I mean. Um, we've moved from kind of one-factor authentication, which is just um, you know one method of verification, to two. Um, a, a lot of Bitcoin wallets have been hacked on, on online. I mean, you know, the way I look at it is that the wallets are the on-ramps to kind of this really secure, distributed, cryptographic network. But we have to get those on-ramps secure to get people to feel comfortable with 
with having all of their data. We're talking about a person's life and all their data on there. So I still think we have uh, a ways to go. I mean, I, I have a few investments that are addressing this, and in, in, uh, particularly in, in the authentic authentication and, and security space. Um, and and I, I think we're going to have those, some of those issues solved fairly soon. I agree with you. There is a company that uh, I, I don't like doing shout outs, but they came to my office and they showed me that uh, he could give me his password to his three form factor authentication for access into his Morgan Stanley account or his JP Morgan account. He gave me his password, gave me his phone. I put it in the phone. I couldn't get in because the phone itself recognized his behavioral patterns. So there are so many technologies like that that are coming up into the stream. And I agree with you that the onboarding onto that cryptographically secured hoteling of data elements is going to be key. That, I call that the last mile, like we used to call the last mile and in internet pops. But Daniel, why don't you chime in and give me your opinion about why or if you agree that cryptographic security plays a very important role here in the identity management. Yeah, my, my head sort of explodes a little bit when you ask that because I, I think it's such a, there's so many layers of this, of, to this question. No? And I think, you know, just repeating a little bit what Jalak said, I think it, like the, the and, and what Juan was saying before, the amount of trust that we as a consumers have uh, been putting a lot of these merchants, a lot of these services, is just mind-boggling to me. And, um, and I think, but I do think that we're getting better just in, in computer science in general in understanding what are some of best practices to manage identity, no? And, and, and for example, we, you were going to ask me what we do. We don't keep uh, the identity of our customers on our servers. They, they don't live there because if we would have a data breach, the last thing that we want is, you know, all of our customers' data to be then everywhere, which has been the case for, in many places. And, and, and I believe uh, the idea of having cryptographic identity is incredibly powerful. We already have a cryptographic value store or medium of exchange, Bitcoin, which works phenomenally well. We have uh, cases where the on-ramps get hacked, but no one's been able to hack you know, the security layer of holding Bitcoins in an address, which is a cryptographically secure method of claiming value over a certain piece of, let's say, data or information. It's the equivalent of you can break into the bank, but you haven't broken the dollar. Correct. And, um, <clears throat> and so if, you, if we achieve this translation over to the consumer, in, uh, sorry, to, to identity and allow consumers to cryptographically control, you know, what gets added to them, what's issued on top of them, what can be accessed throughout the, I think you have something extremely powerful. Unfortunately, I bet that when I say cryptography, a lot of people probably in the audience are like, what the hell is this guy, what's this cryptography thing? It's still something that it's a, it's a difficult thing to understand how it works, and, and it's a difficult thing to mass give to consumers in a way that will be kept secure. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. In, in Mexico, we also started to do biometrics. <clears throat> And, um, and the government issued this cryptographic uh, key that only if you have the key, you can unlock those records, right? And so the idea is that you would only unlock it whenever you want to give someone access to those records. But I went to my accountants, and my accountants asked me for the password to unlock my cryptographic key. And I said, why the hell do I, would I give you this? And he's like, well, no one knows how to operate it. And so they all just give it to us, and we handle it to them. <laughs> And, and, but that's the, that's the reality. You always mm -hmm. have these two big tensions, which is how do you make something that consumers can reliably use on a day-to-day -day basis, and then how do you make something that is extremely secure? And there's this, and there's a trade-off. And we're getting better at m at making the, the technology more consumer-friendly, but be, n not lose its security. But we haven't figured, we haven't cracked it yet. And and these things that you talk about, I think, are very interesting and are getting us there. You know, three form, three way authentication, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, there's two several aspects to technology, to security, of course. But the you have to think also that the first question was why do banks require identification and why do governments? So governments, obviously, for uh, fiscal reasons and for law enforcement reasons, and banks, they need to identify consumers to collect their loans primarily to get the money back, but also, you know, it's a, an asset that you 
it's important to know the customer for business reasons and marketing reasons, right? So, but there's also the aspect of confidentiality or privacy also, right? That um, you have to balance civil liberties. We have to, as society, to balance civil liberties, you know, the, 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 the right to have privacy in our financial information with the required disclosures of our identity to access a service, right, to prove identity. So, uh, but the good thing is that there's innovation also in those respects, and part of that has to do with cryptography, which in a way, uh, an easy way to explain it is, one of the aspects of cryptography is that you take any digital asset, you run it through an algorithm, through a process, mathematical process, and it scrambles everything, all the ones and zeros, right? And it spits out something that is absolutely unintelligible. You cannot read it. It's just, you know, data, uh, capitals, lowercase, numbers, all kinds of letters. And the only way to access it is by holding a private key, by including something and reading it, and it becomes again live again. So it's very complex. It's, it's very um, uh, labor intensive to produce the scrambling, uh, and uh, it's impossible to guess. It's virtually impossible to guess the key that you hold to read it again. So it's basically a, a uh, pathway, a private pathway to the, to the original document. But what's, what I was talking about was about the, this new invention of uh, technologies that have to do with self-sovereignty and layers of zero-knowledge proofs, what's called zero-knowledge proofs. And Jalak was talking about that. So you're able, you, potentially, you, you're able to comply, and potentially, no, it's really working, and some, some systems are already uh, being uh, done. You can show your key or provide, give access to a, uh, someone with the right to access information, but to only a certain layer of that information. For right, example, so that you can prove your, address, your age, for example, without showing your social security number. And that type of trust and confidence would give the citizens of, say, uh, Colombia more uh, confidence uh, to well, deposit uh, that type of security that's and that what I mean. type, type of technology so would give them the confidence to trust the technology. Yeah, of course, they have to uh, overcome the barrier of trusting the technology, like we all do, right? But that is something that, I mean, do you trust internet? Do you trust your email? Do you trust your banks? I mean, there's a false sense of security and safety because of the marketing that we have been bombarded with. So we had, first of all, banks have those thick columns in the front, used to, to show, oh, this is a secure building, uh, we should trust it, look at this guy, the gentleman earned $50 million a year, and they wear $5,000 suits, they must be important, they must be good. Bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it's not necessarily the truth. I mean, we are trusting, we are, be, we are living on a perception of, of safety. And think about that, right? So, so, the, <laughs> so, so you're going to have a, a, a good amount of time to talk about uh, this further. So let me, we've got 10 minutes left. I was talking earlier with uh, a, a representative of the Colombian Association for Information Technology and Communications. And we were talking about, so how do I get 90% of the population of this country that uses cash today when I know cash is going away, we are on the path of government replacements of cash. Why? Because we can tax every transaction, we can monitor every movement of capital flows, we can secure the monetary system within the matrix. How do I get all of these uh, users, especially in these jurisdictions where it's most needed, to trust and flip over from using this paper money to using this digital currency. So I offered my opinion, but before I offer it again to the general public, maybe, Jalak, you could tell me, how do you think uh, a government can pilot a transition of that magnitude? What is a course of action that they can take? Because banks want this, governments want this, regulators want this. How do we do it? Well, I think there are two things. One is that, that security element that, that we've talked about. But what I think is even bigger is this adding value back to the, the user. I mean, in uh -huh. anything, right, uh, any new technology, any new product, I mean, um, we need to show that it's going to benefit the users that are you know, signing up for this. And, um, and I think that's where there's been a lot of failure in, in, in terms of the advocates of this to really show how this is actually empowering the individual if, if used correctly, right? Because it can also 
potentially be abused it, uh, on the back end. Be but but um, but we're not living in a you know a, a secure world in terms of our data. This would allow us to gain control of our data and then be able to permission it out. And I think about medical records too. And you know I mean medical records are being traded at high prices on on uh, the dark web right now yeah. <laughs> um, because. That, that's really important information uh, for, for people to have. And, 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 and so I, I, think, um, I, I think just showing the value back to the user is something the industry has not been good about doing. Thank you. Daniel. Yeah, um, yeah. so very quickly, I think one of the huge challenges with digitizing cash is that the moment that you digitize cash, you make it taxable. And you have a lot of these jurisdictions where you have very, very big and important informal economies. And when you talk about you know, adding value to the user, if that suddenly means that as a user, if I use this new form of payment and I digitize my life, I suddenly need to start paying taxes. You know, I, I pay taxes and I, I, I believe everyone should pay taxes, but if the reality of your country is that a large portion of your people do not pay taxes because they're dealing in an informal economy and paying with cash. You need to figure out what's your transition plan because there's huge incentives against uh, migrating to a digital economy. And that's something that governments really, really think to th have to think through and maybe accept that in the short term, they're going to need to lose those cl the, you know, those, th that, that tax income, which is not coming anyways, but hopefully in the long term, though, the, you know, there'll be a, 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 a bigger benefit for the country. This can come, and I know you're going to have a lot to say about this one, this can come as a consequence of first identity as a result of cryptographic security. So if I have the confidence to deposit my identity in a, in, a, in, a, in a cloud environment that can then allow me to have this identity to use this digital currency which favors the banks and the governments, then perhaps I have an opportunity to be more productive because like Jalak said, I said earlier to the uh, lady who represents this Colombian uh, um, uh, division that it's the little candy at the end, el caramelito. Uh, you, you incentivize them by showing them that living in a cash economy will make them a 1x return on their productivity. Living in a digital economy could give them a 10x return on productivity because they can have access to different services that they don't have today. In line with that comment, you and I have discussed this before, and I'm going to wrap by saying something that you and I discussed before. Tell me your thoughts about okay. <laughs> how do we well, transition? It's, it's a question of, of political will and, and open-mindedness and enlightenment. Yes. I mean, we, you yeah, Nectario said earlier about we need to have a visionary uh, regulator, not uh, laggard uh, in the diffusion and, of the And I, I will argue that against that later, but <laughs> we, have to, He's here. we have to influence. There he is. Policymakers, not regulators. Regulators are, you know, bureaucrats. We need to influence policy making. Meaning, what do we want for our society as humans, as citizens of this country, as citizens of this region, this continent? How do we want to evolve as a society? It's a very philosophical thing. It is. Right? I offer we need to do both. And we discussed right. it today, this morning in our yeah. taxi, and it was fantastic. I encourage having a philosophical conversation with Ari. I'll close but anyway, with that. <laughs> so, but it's, uh, I think it's a question of enlightenment uh, and, and influencing policy. And, and it's a question of thinking outside the box. I mean, we, we're thinking about our mind, mental models are in what is, we are comfortable with. We are, our comfort zone is also intellectual, right? Yeah. Why not think beyond something really probably two centuries from now? Let's think about how, what the world do we need two centuries from now? And, and I had the honor and privilege to uh, meet and, and spend time and work with Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, uh, in Richard Branson's island last May. And we talked about, I mean, th this gentleman has been studying capital and, uh, and how to create real value for society, and how to empower the disenfranchised in the world. And he has an incredible theory about the, the mystery of capital and how to create capital. And the blockchain, combination of blockchain technology with these forward-thinking ideas and the courage to make decisions could open up a world of wealth and richness for the continent, for the country, for the, the poor countries of the world, the two-thirds disenfranchised in the world. Why do we think that way? So I have a little, uh, I have a little uh, story that I tell uh, people when I talk about this. So a country's, uh, a country's currency is 
backed by the capacity of that country to tax their people so that they could sort of pay their debts with that revenue. And taxing their people comes from those people's productive capacity, which means that if A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, and thus the currency's value is derived from the people's productivity. So if the total productive capacity of a nation is what derives the value of the currency, then the people... We are, we the, the people, value of, we of, the, the, people of the, are the value. We the people are the currency. And so if we are the value and we are the currency, we, our identity and a, a secure way of storing that identity needs to be sort of an essential component to solve so that we can transcend into the next sort of digital age of finance. Yeah, so we're out of time. I wish I could talk more with the panelists, but thank you, Jalak, thank you. Daniel, Juan. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. They'll be here for questions later. Un aplauso.